right. Uh, welcome to our third Center for Evolution and Medicine at Arizona State University's uh, seminar speaker series uh, presentations. Today, we welcome Professor Ian Gilby of Arizona State University. He's in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change and uh, here at ASU. Uh, quick introduction for Ian once I open that. All right. Ian earned his, uh, his bachelor's at Carleton College in biology and then moved on to earn a PhD in zoology at the University of Minnesota. Following that, he continued his postdoctoral training with the inimitable Richard Wrangham at Harvard University and then spent several years as a senior research scientist at Duke University. Ian is one of those exceptional scholars who works to deeply understand his phenomena of interest about animal hunting in not only chimpanzees, but seeks to broadly understand the manifestation of related and analogous traits in myriad species. And through this, more comprehensively understand the evolutionary landscape that shapes the species uh, behavioral ecology. Further, his work spans multiple chimpanzee field sites across the course of his career, but he is most notable for his work at Gombe Field Stream. He is the convener of the Gombe Research Consortium and is a key player in stewarding the multi-decade archives of the project and field site launched and made famous by Dr. Jane Goodall. Today, Ian will be talking with us about an understanding of the hunting behavior and nutritional ecology of chimpanzees. And I wanna highlight that Ian is very much a 21st century scholar, investing in not only his research, but as an exceptional educator, mentor, community member, and continuous efforts in science communication. I was delighted and honored to co-lead a study abroad to Australia on One Health with Ian back in the before times in 2019. Please join me in welcoming your friend and mine, Professor Ian Gilby. Wow, well, thank you. That was very, very flattering. I would have to say I was a little uh, nervous about some uh, embarrassing uh, Australia photos coming up. But maybe because I've got the, the worst photo of you queued up from Australia, just in case, maybe that's why you, you didn't do that. Excellent. Well, I've been really excited to, to do this talk for a long time. So thank you very much to Katie and the Center for Evolution and Medicine for inviting me. This is a, a, a great group. I've always enjoyed the seminar series and I'm happy to be really happy to be a part of it. So as Katie said, I'm a behavioral ecologist. Um, so my research, focuses on the evolution of behavior and for me specifically social behavior. And a lot of my work to date has been on uh, hunting and meat sharing among chimpanzees. So I'm just trying to understand uh, the variation in hunting patterns, why they hunt in groups, the effect of individuals and so on. And then of course, why they share meat with each other. Um, but along the way, um, I've also thought a little bit about the role that meat plays in chimpanzee diet. So I am not an expert in nutrition by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I thought that this audience might be somewhat interested in what my sort of my kinds of behavioral studies might be able to tell us about the nutritional consequences um, of meat for chimpanzees, why they eat meat. But first I should give you a little bit of context. Um, why do we care about this question? Humans eat meat more often uh, in greater quantities um, than any other monkey or ape. Um, and in fact, meat consumption is seen by many scientists as one of the defining features of our species. And this increase in meat consumption in our lineage has allowed for uh, the growth of big complex brains and was likely a factor in the evolution of many other peculiarly human traits. Uh, the fact that we walk bipedally, we form pair bonds, um, the sect we have a sexual division of labor, um, central place foraging, and so on, can, can often be or is often attributed to the fact that the amount of meat that we eat increased significantly in, in our lineage. 
So all foraging societies across a wide range of habitats eat meat, whether we're talking about uh, savanna habitats in Africa or uh, uh, tropical forests in South America, Australia, and even in the Arctic. And in fact, for, for um, some groups like the Inuit in the Arctic, meat may be all that they eat for months at a time. So all foraging societies eat meat. But what led to this increase in meat consumption remains a mystery. So it's likely due to the cooling and drying of the environment five to seven million years ago, opening a niche uh, into some more savanna habitats for the, our last common ancestor, undoubtedly encountering new and different types of prey. Uh, so based on the earliest stone tools and cut marks on bones, we suspect that early hominins were probably butchering carcasses two to three million years ago, but it was unclear at that point whether they were hunting or scavenging. So as you, I'm sure many of you know, there's lots and lots of debate there that I'm not gonna to touch on. We're gonna leave that up to paleoanthropologists and archeologists. Um, and also I'm not really gonna be addressing the timing of this major transition into eating more meat either. Instead, I'm going, my, my goal um, is to understand what motivated the last common ancestor of apes and humans to eat meat and how they acquired it. So then early hominins in our lineage would have built upon this foundation built by uh, our last common ancestor. So in other words, if you look at this phylogeny of the living great apes as an illustration, we need to make inferences about this creature right here the last common ancestor of apes and humans, the last, uh, which lived about five to seven million years ago in Africa. Now, as our closest living relatives and as large bodied, primarily fruit eating apes, chimpanzees and bonobos provide us with clues about the behavior of this last common ancestor. So it's important to note that they're, we're not treating them as replicas of the, or, or direct models of the last common ancestor because of course there was five to million years, five to seven million years of evolution along this line as well. So no doubt they've changed somewhat. But they do uh, help us to understand the kinds of ecological pressures faced by the last common ancestor and can sort of give us an idea of the range of variation of behavior that the last common ancestor may have exhibited. Now, uh, both bonobos and chimpanzees are equally related to humans, but chimpanzees eat meat more often. Bonobos do eat meat, um, but not as often, and we don't know as much about meat eating in bonobos as we do in chimps. So that's why I'm gonna concentrate on chimpanzees today. So, uh, a little, little odd to start with the methods, but um, I wanna give you a little bit of background on the two long-term studies that my research primarily draws upon. So Katie mentioned uh, my connection with Gombe National Park. That's my primary research site where Jane Goodall uh, famously started her research in 1960. And there in the early days, Jane made many influential discoveries at Gombe, including the fact that chimpanzees eat meat. Before that, uh, Scientists thought that chimps were just sort of peaceful vegetarians. Turns out they're not. The research team grew in the 60s and then starting in the early 70s, they began systematic follows of chimpanzees. And literally since then, uh, pairs of Tanzanian observers um, every day follow a focal or a target chimpanzee every day, recording its behavior on standardized check sheets, longhand narrative notes uh, and recording this location on a map. These methods are essentially unchanged today, which makes it a really remarkable study with the exception of the fact that they now use GPS units. So the value of these data, particularly because the data collection protocol hasn't changed in so long, cannot be overstated. Um, they're absolutely essential in my mind for studying a species with an incredibly slow life history and uh, for studying relatively rare events, like hunting um, with statistical rigor. 
So my PhD advisor, Ann Pusey, pictured here uh, with Jane overlooking the archive, uh, spearheaded an enormous effort to digitize all these data and then to organize them into a relational database which allows us to quickly extract information from this, this treasure trove. So Anne has recently retired from Duke University and pending final discussion with the Jane Goodall Institute, the paper data and the database will soon be housed uh, in my lab at ASU. So I'm, I'm feel incredibly lucky to be part of this project, which is a, it's, it's a large project and the, it, I, along, I co-direct it along with my co-directors Anne uh, Elizabeth Lonsdorf at Franklin and Marshall College, Mike Wilson at the University of Minnesota, and Carson Murray at uh, George Washington University. So many thanks to them. I also collaborate with researchers um, who study the Kanyuara chimpanzee community in Kibali National Park, Uganda, which is a very similar long-term project uh, as Gombe. It was started by Gombe alum Richard Rangham in 1987. Uh, Richard recently retired from Harvard, but still co-directs the project along with Melissa Emery Thompson and Martin Muller at the University of New Mexico and Zareen Nachanda at Tufts University. So essentially they have a very similar model to the Gombe long-term project. We've got field assistants collecting behavioral data every day. Uh, those data are then organized into a, a relational database, which I actually designed in um, uh, using the Gombe database as a model, so they're very comparable. So I don't have time to go into the specifics um, and the de detail of all the different types of data collected at these two sites, but um, I'm certainly happy to answer questions about them at the end. Chimpanzees live in large social groups that uh, we call communities, typically around 60 or so individuals, and I believe that's the sort of median median size. Some, uh, like my colleague at ASU's uh, Ke Kevin Langergraber's site in GoGo, can be much, much larger, uh, but typically around 60, 60 individuals. Um, males, uh, uh, members of a community share a territory, um, so I'm just sort of depicting that by this oval here, um, which they fiercely defend against rival communities. And they exhibit high fission fusion dynamics, which means that unlike a species like baboons, where in which the social group is mostly not always always together, but typically uh, quite, um, quite often together, all 60 individuals in a chimpanzee community are rarely, if ever, all together at once. So instead, they split into fluid subgroups, or we sometimes call them parties, that change in size and composition. Males are typically more gregarious than females, um, although there is variation among study sites. But at, at, at Gombe and Kanyawara, typically we have males being fairly gregarious, often together in, in groups, and females dotted uh, in ones and twos with their dependent offspring, um, essentially by themselves in the, rest of the, in the rest of the community range. Party size and grouping patterns are uh, essentially determined by food availability. So when there's lots of ripe fruit available, you find them in larger parties. And this has important consequences for the study of hunting behavior, as we'll see. Their diet is dominated by ripe fruit, and uh, they're very picky about it. So you'll see them picking fruits and sniffing them to make sure that they're, they're properly ripe. And if not, they sometimes discard them. Figs, like uh, what Frodo here is eating, are a particularly important food source um, for them. Um, and as I said, the abundance and distribution of food in their range um, greatly affects grouping and travel patterns, which has cascading effects for other behaviors, including eating. In addition to fruit, they also eat young leaves and flowers. So Wilkie here is eating these little yellow flowers in this tree. And also uh, stems and uh, shoots and things like that, as well as uh, invertebrates, like insects, typically termites and ants. And famously at some sites, including Gombe, they do so with tools. So in this case, uh, we have a chimpanzee who's using a long blade of grass 
to extract termites from a termite mound, which is a very laborious but ultimately rewarding task and very hard to do. I can't do it. And of course, if this was a surprise to you before the uh, talk started, it shouldn't be now. Um, they also eat meat. So Jane famously first observed this in 1960, and she was on a, on a, on a ridge looking over a valley, uh, and she saw a group of chimps on the, other, on the other side eating and fighting over something red, and with the binoculars she could see that it was actually the carcass of a young bushbuck fawn. So she first observed this in 1960, put Gombe on the map, um, and it's now been observed at all other long-term uh, sites with varying levels of frequency. So they do, meat is uh, eaten at all these sites, but it is re eaten relatively rarely. So here's a quick and dirty breakdown of the Gombe chimpanzee diet um, from, over, from the, the, the whole study. And as you, as you can see, uh, it's dominated by fruit, ripe fruit and leaves. So over 82% of their time spent feeding is on ripe fruit and leaves. Uh, and you can see here that meat is about, is 4.3% of their time spent feeding, insects 3.2, and then other things um, like honey and stems and things like that uh, make up the other 5.9%. So 4.3% of your feeding time on average is not that much. Kanyawara, as you can see, is even less than that at about 1.1% of feeding time. And then at Mahali, which is a site uh, south of Gombe in Tanzania, um, uh, Hosaka et al. estimated that they ate 14, uh, 45 grams per day on average, which is, again, not very much. I'll concede that feeding time is not an ideal measure, um, but as you can see, as you will see later in the talk, um, little is known about the nutritional contribution of meat to chimp diet, and we just simply don't have estimates yet in terms of the actual nutritional contribution. So what do they eat? What, what do they prey upon, I should say? So they do eat some uh, arboreal primates, relatively rarely, um, these guys. So uh, red-tailed monkeys, black and white colobus monkeys, blue monkeys. Um, and they also prey upon young bush pigs. Look cute little baby bush pig here. Um, bushbuck fawns, bushbuck are like um, deer essentially. Um, and and ant dikers are small forest antelopes. And then small animals like galagos um, and uh, bird nestlings and things like that that live in uh, cavities in trees. So hunts of the bottom uh, row here don't usually involve any kind of pursuit. Instead, that's more often a, a quick opportunistic grab um, as they find them. But by far the most important prey species uh, in uh, all chimpanzee sites where they are found together um, is the red colobus monkey pictured here. So these guys are, again, arboreal monkeys. They uh, live in large groups, 50 or so individuals, and are arboreal, they live in trees. And adults weigh maybe eight to 10 kilograms, uh, so there's a you know, sizable amount of meat there. Although at some sites like Gombe, chimpanzees tend to target uh, juveniles and infants, so smaller, smaller packages of meat. And these guys fiercely defend themselves when they're being, when they're being hunted. Um, so they're really quite formidable. They've got large canines. The males uh, will drop down and attack the chimpanzees who are chasing after them while the youngsters and moms try to, try to flee. Trigger alert here. I'm just going to show a quick video of what hunting looks like, uh, hunting red colobus looks like um, at, the, at the end. There's some scenes of meat eating um, where you can see that it's a monkey. There's no horrible blood or anything. The monkeys are, have, have passed. So um, if, you, if this makes you uncomfortable, just look away for a moment. But this is, it's impossible to really describe what a, a colobus hunt looks like. So I thought I would share it with you. So that's what red colobus monkeys look like. They're looking nervous. They're up in the trees. 
a group, a small group of male chimps has uh, found them and are down below looking up to see if they can find vulnerable individuals. And then at some point they charge into the trees after the monkeys. You can see Frodo here fighting off, chasing and fighting off males who are attacking him, male colobus. And sometimes they take great risks flying through the air to catch these guys. So when they catch a monkey, there's often chaos to begin with, or the monkey's sometimes divided, which is happening here. And then the scene kind of settles down and the meat possessor is often surrounded by several individuals who are begging for a portion of the carcass. And often meat is shared with them in this fashion. Okay, if you looked away, it's safe now. Oops. So as I said, at all sites where chimpanzees and red colobus coexist, uh, they are the most frequent prey species. So here are data from five long-term sites, and you can see that around 80% of the prey items at Kanyawara, Gombe, Mahali, and Thai um, are red colobus. Um, you'll notice that at Ngogo, Kevin Langergraber's site, um, in one study they made over, oh, the red colobus accounted for more than 90% of prey. Um, this has changed in recent years there as the, um, at this rate, as you might, not, might uh, see from this or might derive from this, uh, the red, red colobus population has crashed there due to overhunting by chimps. So there's one aspect of hunting colobus that will be important for several of the hypotheses um, about why chimpanzees and there are also very, very few univer universal patterns in chimpanzees or when it comes to chimpanzee behavior, uh, but this is one of them. So at all sites, upon encountering a red colobus troop, a hunt is more likely to occur if there are many male chimpanzees present in the prey. So, in other words, the likelihood of a hunt occurring is proportional to the number of male chimpanzees who are present in the party that encounters them. So there's a nice clear effect here from using data from Kanyawara, but is also true everywhere. So as I said earlier, party size is associated with food availability. So when there's lots of ripe fruit, you find the chimpanzees grouping in bigger parties, not much fruit, small parties. So in many of the analyses that I'm going to be showing you, I had to statistically control for party size when assessing what factors affect hunting probability. And you'll see what I mean by that. Okay, to the research now. Why do chimpanzees hunt? What are the main benefits of eating meat? Well, as I tried to illustrate with the video and my description, hunting red colobus is really costly. Uh, in terms of energy, energy expenditure. So at Gombe, the average hunt lasts 30 minutes. Um, and it's also risky, both in the ecological sense, because 50% of hunts fail. Um, so there's a 50% chance that the effort's gonna be wasted. Um, and it's also risky in terms of injury. You saw that clip of that chimpanzee flying through the air to catch a monkey. Males, uh, hunters fall, they, break bones, um, and it's, so it's really quite risky. So with those risks in mind, particularly the energetic costs, maybe chimpanzees forego hunting when ripe fruit is plentiful, okay? So there's no need to take these risks for calories because there's lots of calories available in the fruit that they're, that's available in their habitat. And that they only, maybe they only take on hunting costs when alternative sources of calories are scarce. So meat is a nice digestible concentrated source of calories. So perhaps, so here we have poor Gimbal here. I love this photograph that uh, my friend Kristen Mosher took many years ago, won a wildlife award. He's eating pith, 
which is the spongy tissue inside vines, okay? It's really, it does not look good. It is, and it's certainly not very nutritious. Okay? And they tend to eat pith when there's not a lot of ripe fruit available. So perhaps while he's eating this pith, he's actually, he would be more likely to hunt at these times, okay? That man meat would be great right now because I just can't get enough energy out of these, out of this horrible pith. So that's the hypothesis. And John Matani and David Watts uh, in their 2001 paper called this uh, the nutrient shortfall hypothesis. Seems logical. So we tested this um, using long-term data from Kanyawara. Um, and we actually showed uh, that the opposite was happening, that hunting is actually more frequent when diet quality is high. So diet quality here was measured in terms of the abundance of high quality preferred fruit. Okay. Um, and specifically fruits that have, have been shown since then to have high energy content. And what you'll see from this graph, I hope, is that critically this increase in hunting during plentiful times is not simply due to the fact that large groups are more, large, large parties are more likely to form during high quality fruit season. So what we did was we controlled for male chimpanzee party size, and then for each size party, asked what the, the number of hunts per 100 hours would, was, the rate of hunting. So, if you, so for example, if you take parties of six males, you find that during high quality fruit seasons, they averaged over two, over two hunts per every 100 hours, compared to only one hunt per 100 hours uh, during four times. So I should also note that at uh, Gombe and then also at Ngogo, we do also see an increase in hunting during uh, high fruit periods, but in, at those sites, it does appear to be due to larger party sizes only. So we also looked at it um, another way, that was hunting rates, but that also, that doesn't account for uh, uh, increase in, or, or at the rate at which they encountered prey. So we also looked at it at the level of the colobus encounter uh, and found exactly the same pattern. So during, again, during periods when preferred fruit, fruit fruits, excuse me, were particularly abundant, and especially two species here, Pseudospondius uh, microcarpa and Nimisops begshawii, um, when in those seasons, when those fruits were plentiful, we found that um, the probability of hunting upon encountering colobus was significantly higher than during other fruit times. So this suggests that hunting is almost a luxury activity that they undertake when they can afford to fail. Um, and then and when other energy rich foods are available as a fallback. So this does not support that nutrient shortfall hypothesis. I'm gonna take a, a little bit of a detour here and you'll see why in a minute. Um, calories are central to one of the major debates about chimpanzee hunting. Um, and that is why do chimpanzees hunt in groups? Um, is group hunting by chimpanzees technically um, fit the definition of, co of cooperation? So by cooperation here, I mean, I'm gonna just use the simple definition used by behavioral ecolo ecologists, which has to do with the outcome, not about any kind of coordination. And it's simply defined as joint action for mutual benefit. That is, by working as a group, whether it be intentionally or not, individuals do better uh, than by acting, than if they were acting alone. Therefore, there's an incentive for them to cooperate and not to defect and let others do the dirty work. So if, if hunting, so the traditional view of hunting by chimps um, is that if it's cooperative, then per capita meat intake, so the amount of meat that an individual chimp gets at a hunt 
should be positively correlated with the number of hunters, meaning that there's incentive for that male to participate in the hunt. However, uh, in another old study of mine, um, we found that at Gombe, um, while the number of hunters did mean there was an increase in the number of prey captured per hunt, okay, this line here, so more likely to make multiple kills if there are more, you know, a large number of chimpanzees in the, in the hunting party. That's true, but that did not translate to a caloric benefit for individuals. So if you look at, if you basically take the number, what I did here, very simple, is all I could do as well, was take the number of prey captured per hunt and divide it by the number of males that were there, and you find that the kilograms of meat per male actually significantly decreased with adult male party size. Um, this is consistent with what we see at, at Ngogo and at Kanyawara, except we don't see a negative effect. We just see no effect. Okay? Now, full disclosure, of course, the, 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 the best measure here would be how much meat each individual in the hunt gets, right? But it's really, really difficult to measure Oh, I would say impossible to measure intake by every individual in a hunting party to any degree of, of, um, of detail. Um, so I recognize that this isn't ideal, but it's the best we can do at this point. Nevertheless, what these data suggest is that hunting in groups does not result in a caloric benefit for males. Um, in fact, it may come at a cost. Okay, so why did I take that detour into cooperation? Well, it's a fascinating question, um, of course, and I could go on and on about cooperation for hours. I won't, um, but it does have something to do with diet. Okay? So the fact that hunting may come at a caloric loss to an individual made me think about what the other benefits of eating meat might be. That aren't calories. Okay. So for group hunting to have been selected for, there has to be a benefit to the individual. Okay. So if it's not calories, then what might that benefit be? So in addition to being rich, rich in energy, meat is also a valuable concentrated source of micronutrients that are essential for humans and we assume are essential for chimpanzees as well, although we don't really know what chimpanzee nutritional requirements are. So some of these micronutrients uh, include, but are not limited to calcium, sodium, potassium, iron, zinc, and then several vitamins. And in particular, B12 is one that's been uh, uh, labeled as being very, very important for brain development. So these micronutrients, I need to point out, are not necessarily absent in plant diet. Many people say, well, since, you know, chimpanzee eat meat eating is relatively rare and some sites don't do it very much at all, then it's not essential. Um, so they can probably get many of these things, these micronutrients from, from plant food and from other, uh, from insects, for example, but it's just so much, they're so much more readily available in meat. And critically, um, they are valuable in small amounts. So my colleagues and I, uh, Claudio Tenney and Richard Rangham, and I proposed this meat scrap hypothesis, which proposes that because of micronutrients, meat in any amount, even a tiny scrap, is beneficial to, to one who can get it, even though it might come as a, at a caloric cost. So if this is true, then hunting in groups should be selected for um, if it increases a male's chance of obtaining meat in any amount. So it's not about the amount of meat anymore, it's just getting meat at all. So we tested this um, at uh, Kanyawara and at Gombe as well. Here's the data from, from Kanyawara. Um, and indeed, we found that the probability that a given male obtained meat uh, increased significantly with the number of hunters in a, in, in a hunting party. 
very clear relationship there. Okay? I should point out that with all, many of these charts, I'm glossing over the statistics, um, put a, a few uh, nuggets in the bottom corner. These, these regressions or the, these graphs, when there's a line there, those are the predicted values from a regression. So the, those are the regression lines with 95% confidence intervals. When, the, when I show raw data, I'll say it's the raw data. Um, so importantly though, um, it's not just captors who get meat. Okay? Individuals can also get meat um, by begging for it um, and receiving it via sharing or by gathering fallen scraps. So this graph doesn't take that into account. All this shows is that as the number of hunters in a hunting party increases, the probability that a given male gets meat increases. So we wanted to look at, to, to parse this out by hunters versus bystanders. And we found a very interesting pattern. So we redid that analysis, differentiating between hunters and non-hunters, and found that when there's only two, three, or four hunters, okay, this end of the, the, the graph, that there's an advantage to being one of those hunters. Okay, that a hunter is significantly more likely to get meat than a bystander in those small groups. But there's a st statistically significant um, interaction between, um, just to simplify it, for non-hunters, the probability of receiving meat increases with party size or with the number of hunters. So at groups, in groups where there are five individuals hunting, a bystander is became just as likely to get meat as a hunter was. So if the meat scrap hypothesis is correct, and that all that matters to an individual is getting a small amount of meat, then if five males are already hunting, then there should be no added, added incentive for a bystander to start hunting. Okay. In other words, when non-hunters can reliably obtain meat, males should stop, should refrain from joining a hunt and, and wait to get meat from, by being a beggar or a, a scrap hoarder. Okay. So there's a prediction. And amazingly, I'm still, you know, still amazed by this result after all these years. That's pretty much exactly what we found. So here is a regression of focal hunting probability, so the percent of encounters in which a focal male hunted um, as a function of the number of adult male chimpanzees in a party. And we included male party size as a piecewise linear predictor, which basically just allows us to include an inflection point in the curve, uh, even though it's, two it's basically two linear models. Okay? And we found that there was a significant positive effect of male party size on hunting by the focal male, but only in groups of up to six. And then, then in larger parties, increasing the number of males present did not increase focal hunting probability. Okay, so this supports the meat scrap hypothesis, the idea that these micronutrients in small amounts provide enough benefit to justify hunting, um, paying the cost to hunt. Okay. Um, a small amount of meat is enough. So there's a lot of data missing here. The specific micro micronutrient content of wild game is not well known, uh, in particular, including um, the content of different tissues and organs. So there's going to be more on that in a minute. Um, and then also, uh, we, again, we don't really know what the nutritional requirements of chimpanzees are. With that in mind, though, these data are, uh, in, are, are very informative in my view. Now, of course, I'm not claiming that micronutrients are the only thing. Um, there isn't going to be one single benefit to eating meat. Um, perhaps meat is also important because of its protein content. Um, we know that protein is critical for building and maintaining tissues. Um, forms enzymes, hormones, and so on. Um, so is there any evidence that chimps are protein limited in any way? Not really. 
at least if we're talking about crude protein content. So an early study done by Nancy Wu, Conk and Britton, and Richard Rangham and others um, have shown that there's plenty of protein in leaves. And as, I, as you saw from the earlier chart, chimpanzees spend a considerable amount of time eating those leaves. However, leaves do often contain uh, antifeedants. Leaves don't want to be eaten. Okay, so they have tannins and uh, other, other compounds, which limit the amount that can be eaten. Um, and they also contain a lot of fiber, which increases bulk, dietary bulk, and reduces digestibility. By contrast, animal proteins um, are more easily digestible and importantly contain favorable ratios of essential amino acids. Now, these, you know, I say animal protein, I, I include insects and invertebrate, in other invertebrates as well, right? But we've argued in, uh, in an earlier paper that, you know, yeah, insects are great, but for the, it, it, under most circumstances, they're really not that efficient to capture. Just think about termite fishing, where you just get a few, term, you know, termites every dip. Okay, sometimes you get big um, events, but it's mostly, uh, pretty inefficient to uh, capture termites and other insects. So if a chimpanzee can get meat, okay, then protein will certainly be one of the, one of the benefits of getting meat. So the, the jury's still kind of out on this. Um, given that protein is plentiful in other aspects of their diet, the general consensus is that protein is not a major driver of hunting behavior, but it's likely to be important. Okay, what other macronutrients uh, might be important? Well, many have proposed that fat is particularly important. So fat, uh, we all love it, right? So um, there's a reason for it. More than, it, fat contains more than twice the energy per unit mass than starch or protein, and it's also easily absorbed. And then of particular importance are polyunsaturated long chain fatty acids or PUFAs. Um, and these are especially important for brain growth and function. Now these include famous things like the omega-3 fatty acids, which we, you know, people take supplements for, um, and DHA. And importantly, some of these long chain fatty acids, particularly DHA, are absent in most plants. They can be synthesized from, long, from short chain precursors, but obtaining them from animal matter is undoubtedly the most efficient. If you then consider chimpanzee diet in general, we, we know that chimpanzee diet is very low in fat, with the exception of termites, okay? But as I said, they're, uh, they're ephemeral for one, and also not particularly efficient to capture. Um, and then also some, of, some oily nuts like oil palm. But fat is, fat is a prized item. The wild game mussel is typically very lean. It has similar fat content to what is found in plant food. So on the face of it, you might think, okay, well then, you know, hunting colobus is not really going to be motivated by fat except for one fact, that the brains and the liver and the bone marrow are loaded with long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. So, and the head is, a is an easily targeted body part, right? It's just dangling off there, right? So if these long chain fatty acids are one of the primary benefits of hunting, you would, and if given a choice, you'd expect chimps to go for the brain first, particularly if they're, as you saw from some of the video clips, that they're often faced by several beggars who are trying to get portions of the carcass. The carcass is sometimes stolen, so they should eat the most valuable parts first, just in case. Skulls can be hard to break into, however, um, and, and, and you would expect that the skulls of juveniles should be easier to break into than adults. So this predicts that uh, when in position, possession of a subadult prey item, the captor should target the head first. 
And then if they can't break the skull, then they should go for the liver. So this is a fun little paper that I did with, uh, he was an under, undergraduate at ASU at the time. And this is using my research footage from my, my ancient dissertation uh, work at Gombe National Park where I was studying meat sharing. But I had footage of meat eating after 46 successful hunts. So we were able to identify 29 cases where we you know, observed the, observe the meat eating about from start to finish and we could um, observe which body part was eaten first without any doubt. And we could only really uh, differentiate between head, torso, abdomen, and appendage. It would have been great if I could you know, really look at whether or not they're eating the liver as opposed to the stomach first, but we just simply can't do that. Um, so uh, another very short trigger warning. Here is a chimpanzee, my favorite, my boy, Frodo, after seconds after catching an infant juvenile uh, colobus monkey. Bit hard to see, swings up, and you can see he's got it hanging out. It's got his head in its head in his mouth. So you can see, very clearly see what he's eating first. And what invariably happens is you see that the brain, get, the skull gets crushed, it, it looks really limp, and they're essentially sucking the brain out. So here are the data, small sample size, I'll admit, but um, it's pretty clear. For the 11 subadult prey in the sample, uh, 10 of them were eaten head first. Uh, and that single instance was by a very old male who had terrible teeth, and he was actually trying to break open the skull, but he couldn't do it. Then for the 18 adult prey, a little, little less than half were eaten head first, and um, most of the rest were eaten torso first. So this is statistically significant. Um, the, the, the head was statistically more likely to be chosen first, but there was a, there was a uh, interaction term, significant interaction between prey age and body part. So essentially what it means is they ate the brains first when it was easy to do so. They often did for adult prey, but frequently went for the torso first, which, which contains that fat-rich liver. So this fun little study showed that in this small sample of meat-eating bouts, chimps were most likely to select the head first when it was relatively easy to access, suggesting that of all parts of the carcass, the brain was, the chimp, chimps value the brain the most, likely due to its high fat content. So this is important to highlight the um, fact that we should really note which parts of carcass chimps are getting or sharing, but I will admit that it's pretty hard. Possible future directions here. Uh, it would be great to do choice experiments in captivity with different tissues and organs. And then also um, this, again, surprisingly little known about the nutritional content of organs and tissues of wild game. So a couple more data slides here. Um, you may have noticed so far that I've talked mainly about males. Um, and there's a reason for this. Males hunt more often than females do. Here are some stats from various sites, ranging from 70% uh, at Joe Preetz's site in Fongoli to one study at Ngogo, where 97% of kills were made by males. But this photo here that I'm very proud of and fond of um, is, a, is actually a female chimp catching a juvenile colobus monkey. They can and do hunt. So why do female chimps hunt less often than males do? So again, I see this as another opportunity to, to use behavior to identify what the nutritional benefits of eating meat might be. So first explanation for that is that chimpanzees encounter red colobus less often than males do. So Gombe chimps don't appear to search for prey. Um, and because they're in smaller groups and often by themselves, females travel less. Uh, their day ranges are shorter than males. So it follows that they just may simply be less likely to encounter prey, and these data show that. Um, 
So controlling for the follow duration, um, you can see that females um, in this, these lower squares encounter red colobus at lower rates than males do okay, for a given follow duration. So they simply don't have as many opportunities as males. But that is not the whole story because when a hunt occurs and a female is there, females are significantly less likely to participate in a hunt than, than focal males. Okay. So uh, if you're male, male about 75% chance of participating in a, in a hunt that's, that's occurring, females only less than 50%. So together with that first result, that reduced opportunity is partly responsible for the low rates of female hunting, but when given the chance, females still hunt red colobus less often than males do. So there must be another explanation. So a hint is here. Um, when we break down female hunting probability according to the number of male chimpanzees present, we get a little bit of insight here. This is the opposite pattern that we see for males. For males, we see a positive slope. A given male is more likely to hunt if lots of other males are hunting. Females, it's opposite to that, okay? So I thought that was weird because you know, I, 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 I was expecting to see a positive result because more chaos, uh, more hunters means there's more opportunities for females to, 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 to capture prey. But then I remembered what male chimpanzees are like. And what typically happens when a female uh, catches a monkey is that some big male displays at her, hits her, steals the carcass, leaving her begging for the meat that she worked so hard to get. Okay. So I looked at the probability um, of this happening, of a theft occurring, um, based on the number of males present in a party, and there's a strong positive relationship. So a female is far more likely to lose her carcass to a male um, when there are lots of males around. So this likely deters females from hunting. Finally, uh, red colobus, and not quite finally, penultimately, um, red colobus and other arboreal monkeys, as I said, are very costly and dangerous to pursue. There's a lot of time, time and energy spent chasing them, and prey have large canines and they fight back and there's risk of falling. By contrast, other prey are less costly. So juvenile bush pigs and baboons, uh, baboon infants, they're terrestrial, so they're less energetically costly to pursue, but they do have parents who fight back. And particularly in the case of the bush pigs, that can be pretty terrifying. Um, bushbuck fawns and prey that hide in tree cavities um, are uh, easy to catch and they're also not at all formidable. So when we look at the sex of the individuals who typically catch these prey items, we see that females tend to avoid the dangerous, costly um, arboreal monkeys and to some extent the pigs and baboons, even though they still hunt those significantly more than arboreal monkeys, and tend to um, specialize in eating these um, low risk, low cost prey. So despite the value of meat, females don't get as much meat as males do, which likely explains why females spend more time eating insects, which is actually a project that I'm working on now that needs to have more attention needs to be paid to. So lastly, in a study with Rob O'Malley and Carson Murray, we found interesting data variation in female meat consumption. Um, and so we found that among cycling females, okay, so cycling females are those that aren't pregnant and aren't nursing, lactating, um, high ranking females ate more meat um, in terms of percent time um, than low ranking females did. And this fits with my 2017 study showing that high-ranking females hunt more as well. But while pregnant, low-ranking females increase their meat consumption to one that's statistically indistinguishable from uh, high-ranking females, suggesting that there, there's some aspect of meat is critical for fetal development. So basically during pregnancy, they make up for the fact that they don't get much, they normally don't get much meat. 
meat consumption during lactation probably doesn't increase because it's hard to hunt with an infant hanging off of you. So this is something that would be super interesting to follow up on this. And I just wish I knew somebody who is an expert in development and lactation. Does anybody know of one? Well, maybe that person doesn't exist, but if they do, they should uh, contact me. So in the title, I promised something about social benefits of, of hunting. And this is a huge area of debate. Some have argued, many have argued, that since hunting is so rare, meat eating is not essential. So that so the main motivation for hunting can't be nutritional. So instead, an alternative has been that chimpanzees hunt mainly for the social benefits that they may gain by sharing meat with others after a hunt. So here we have a male chimpanzee with a female chimp begging for meat. So Perhaps chimps hunt mainly to acquire meat in order to then trade with others for various commodities, including sex, grooming, coalitionary support. So there really are two questions here. The first is, does such trade occur? And then, and there's a lot of debate about that. So for example, at some sites, male pairs that frequently groom are more likely to share meat. I found on, on the other hand, and have argued for a more simple explanation for sharing that they share to reduce harassment by persistent beggars. As always, it's probably some combination of the two. Okay? So we're not going to debate that here. That's an entirely, that's a whole lecture, another whole lecture. But the second question is whether or not the potential for trade affects hunting decisions. So I personally think that this is highly unlikely. Um, given the apparent nutritional value of meat and in the fact and the fact that in captive studies chimps find it very difficult to overcome immediate gratification when it comes to food okay so and we have to finally remember that the whole reason why meat is a potential trading uh, commodity is that it's valuable nutritionally so I strongly believe that they're hunting to get meat first uh, first and foremost for its nutritional value, and then they may or may not use it um, in social transactions. So what have we learned? We've learned that meat has, or I've argued that meat has high nutritional value for chimpanzees, even in small amounts, for various reasons listed there. Um, and it seems likely that the last common ancestor of apes and humans hunted uh, for similar benefits and probably in similar ways. So how does this help us? Uh, well, it gives us, a, it gives us a jumping off point for then surmising, inferring what happened in our lineage. Seems likely that the increase in meat eating uh, was driven by increased encounter rate with prey based on uh, ex exploitation of a, new, of a savanna type niche. Hominins would have to travel further, uh, likely encountering more prey species, and then they would sort of have a, would have a ratcheting effect um, more food, uh, more meat, larger brains, more, more meat, larger brains, etc. So the next steps, um, I'm currently working on another collaborative paper looking at trade-offs between meat and insect eating. Again, giving us an idea of the specific nutrients that chimpanzees are seeking. Um, and I'm also seeking collaborations with folks who can assess the dietary requirements of wild primates and then also to conduct nutritional analyses of chimp uh, prey species, including specific tissues. So very quickly, I hope I've made this clear that this is a hugely collaborative endeavor from both sites. So at Gombe, this is a very, very short subset of the long, long list of people, but especially, especially grateful to Jane and to Ann Pusey for giving me the opportunity to work um, at this incredible site with these incredible data. And of course, the uh, researchers on the ground at Gombe who know far more about chimps than we ever do. Very similar list from Kanyawara with all of the uh, data collectors and um, um, uh, field managers over the years. So with that, I think I went on a little bit too long. I hope you're all still there um, awake and I would love to take some questions. Katie's clapping, that's good. <laughs> Wonderful. So I'm 
um, I'm going to invite Howard uh, Lannis to start. He had a great question, um, and then we can work backwards through some of them, and people can uh, jump in uh, as they see fit. I was just, I was just a kind of couple of questions. Do you think hunting could also be linked to like male male competition? Just a thought. And the second was, have you ever heard of the hunter hypothesis when it comes to human evolution? Like our dependency on hunting drove much more of our evolution, like our tool use and our bigger brains. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, that's, that's what I was alluding to at the beginning, that, that, that um, our reliance on meat is, has been linked to so many things. Um, your question, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling here because um, on my screen, the, the person sitting next to you is Kristen Hawks. Hi, Kristen, um, <laughs> who is um, one of the strongest proponents of the show-off hypothesis, which is essentially what you're, what you're saying, um, that males hunting um, serves as a way to impress um, other males or impress females with their, you know, with their general, with their general prowess. And, you know, as, as uh, Kristen will, will say, there's loads of debate about this in the human literature. Um, and I would argue that the, um, the jury is still out. With chimps, it's really hard to say. Again, I'm, absolutely moving away from trying to say that there's sort of one explanation for, you know, one own, lone explanation for why chimps do what they do. You know, there's, there's probably, you know, every, everything is important. Um, for me though, the, uh, the given how important, given the, the potential importance um, nutritionally of that, that meat poses, and given the, uh, and chimps are smart, but they're not known, they're not great at planning ahead. Um, and as I alluded to with captive studies, they, they're, you know, they sometimes can't even function, you know, basic tasks if there's food there. Like they're, they're sometimes really good at doing, you know, trading, trading for things. If those tokens, um, even if those tokens, um, translate to food in the future, they, they can do it. But if it's the actual food, they just can't help themselves. And so I think that, you know, thinking ahead to whether or not they're sharing with others in the future and whether or not their behavior is going to, you know, be impressive or not, I'm, 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 I'm skeptical, let's put it that way. Ian, I'm going to ask a question um, on behalf of one of the students that they messaged to me. And um, it's, it's this, uh, I think, is quite interesting. And they were asking about whether or not fruit, like when we think of fruit as ripe because of our digestive abilities, um, is that comparable to chimpanzees? Or um, do they have the peak digestibility at a different ripening stage? Um, and of course, this might be variable across fruit and stuff like that. But do, do we think that? The ripeness of fruit is pretty conserved across primates, or what do we know about that? Can you speak to that? Remember, remember at the beginning when I said I wasn't an, uh, an expert in <laughs> nutrition? Um, All right. I, mean, I don't, I, I can't give you the answer to that. I, um, Have you ever tried to eat any of the chimpanzee it's terrible. fruit? Terrible. So, so that was where I was going, that's where I was going with this, is that there, the, a lot of the fruit that chimps eat smells really good. And we're, you know, we're out there in the forest all day without any food and we start, you know, being kind of jealous. And the times though, when I have eaten chimp fruit, most of the time it's incredibly, um, it's bitter. It's, it sort of sucks all the moisture out of your mouth. Uh, it's horrible. And it's really, it's full of seeds. Um, so, but we know that the sugar content is high and that is definitely um, affected by how ripe they are. Uh, interesting work at Kanyawara has shown that fruits at the tops of trees ripen uh, are more ripe than at the bottom. So there's a, there's a hierarchy. So the higher ranked individuals tend to feed higher in the trees because that's where the more ripe fruit is. Um, I'm sure, I see Zareen there. I mean, I'm sure some measure, some, some member of the Kanyawara team who's done the most work on nutritional analyses might be able to answer the question of comparable levels of ripeness. 
for humans, Zareen? I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, but. Yeah, I mean, I think the data from Kanuara show that the ripest fruit that we have or the highest sugar fruit that we have is the same amount of sugar as carrots, domestic carrots. So even though they do, I agree, they smell good, they taste terrible, and you know, they, they definitely are not sweet like we think of ripe fruit. Um, but I would say, and Ian's probably seen this too, you know, when, when mangoes are in season in the neighboring village or something like that, chimps love oh, yeah. crop rating for like ripe fruit um, mangoes that yeah. we would think of as like ripe fruit, sugar cane. So they certainly kind of, and the food grunts they get from mangoes or sugar cane are just off the chart. So they really do like those. Uh, there's, um, there's kind of, there's two questions. Um, and I'm going to uh, introduce them together because um, I think they feed into one another. Um, so one of the questions is, is how might different species that are prey items for chimpanzees potentially be reservoirs for infectious diseases like Ebola? And then uh, India schneider Kreese expand that and, and want to know, do we know anything about the parasite disease related costs of consuming rock holobus, pig, bushbuck, um, I'm pr thinking primarily of those pathogens that can be transmitted through consumption. Um, are you ever, you know, what, what do you know about um, the infectious transmission of zoonotic diseases from prey species to the chimpanzees? Well, I mean, the first, you know, the thing that immediately comes to mind right away is SIV, but um, that's from chimps to humans. So that's, and that's, that's, per, that's, you know, based on on hunting, obviously. I mean, again, not an expert, but my my take is that the the chances are they're they're high, right? I mean, given the fact that they are you know relatively closely related to their most frequent prey species, you know, suggests that there's an opportunity for zoonoses, right? Um, they, I'll, I'll deflect that a little bit by saying that. Uh, Compared to many other animals and humans as well, they are really they really don't scavenge very much, um, which is a, which is a definitely um, a, p a potential for uh, getting sick. Um, so they steal carcasses from baboons, uh, which I think is pretty analogous to the kind of power scavenging. Uh, scenarios that people have put forth for early hominins, but those are freshly killed carcasses. So um, they definitely seem disease averse, uh, risk averse in terms of eating eating rotten meat. I mean, there are definitely there are a handful of of cases, but they generally uh, only only eat it when it's fresh. Okay, um, you have a question. Can you see the chat? Um, there's a question from James Newell. Do female bonobos, being more socially dominant, play a more active role in hunting than their chimpanzee counterparts? Terrific question. And, and by the way, Jack is a—he's a—he's uh, a, a student in my lab. Um, so, this I, one, one thing I have to say about how the, the, these these long-term data sets is uh, they, they provide great opportunities for students to get research experience. So, uh, so yes, in in a, in a word, yes. Female, again, we, we're still learning about what bonobos do. Um, and because they hunt less than chimps do, then, you know, it's, and they haven't been studied for as long, um, we're still learning. But what we know is yes, female, uh, female bonobos do hunt m way more than uh, proportionally compared to males than female chimps do. And um, they are also typically, it's the females that are in control of the carcasses. Uh, rather than the males, so that you know, stealing from the stealing from fe stealing from females data that I showed um, it would not be would 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 be the opposite I would think of what you would see in bonobos. All right. Um, so the, uh, here's a question from one of the students. Um, what is the most probable reason or set of probable reasons why chimpanzees might break into hunter versus bystander roles? Um, and, and what do you think is motivating that? And um, especially if, 
What? Go ahead. Giddy up. All right. Where should I start? Now, I'm super, super interested in individual variation in uh, hunting propensity. Okay. Um, and this is based on my field work where I could just see that some individuals are just, for whatever reason, uh, and we're still trying to sort this out, um, just far more inclined to hunt than others. Um, this is where, unfortunately, studying, ch this is not the best model system because, you know, we, you, need so, you need so many individuals to really properly understand why we see such variation. Rank doesn't seem to be um, a, an issue. So we have some high ranking males who are really gung-ho hunters, but also some low ranking males. Um, it certainly could be uh, how often those individuals get meat. Um, my impression is that's not the case because you know it seems that the, you know the ones that hunt a lot or the ones that are the keenest the ones that get meat a lot tend to be, seem to be the one who are the keenest to hunt. Uh, there's guaranteed to be a genetic aspect, I would think, right? Risk proneness. So you know if these were you know insects, I would you know look for uh, you know there there are gene complexes associated with novelty seeking and. Uh, and risk and 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 risk taking. That Katie's yes. Oh, so um, so some of the work that's been done in free ranging rhesus macaques has looked at information about impulsivity in terms of um, like routes that are picked through a canopy for travel um, and willingness to jump further distances are uh, associated with aspects of some serotonergic pathways. Um, and some genetic, um, some underlying genetic traits. And so I don't know if you have any data about what constitutes kind of risky motor behavior in chimpanzees. I don't know if it's analogous. Um, and, but no. this kind of canopy movement was predictive of aspects of social impulsivity and rank attainment in adulthood in free ranging rhesus macaques. Cool, that's definitely something to look into. Um, I mean, we definitely, so other risk taking things that they do is that going on, going on boundary patrols, um, that's a risky thing. I mean, just things like, you know, if you're, if you're in two, you know, two, two trees that are adjacent to one another, I mean, sometimes you see chimps do these incredible acrobatic jumps from one tree to the next. And maybe there's variation in who decides to climb down and climb back up again. Possibility, yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to quickly say that this, I think that variation in hunting uh, propensity is really, really interesting because we've, I've found that the, the presence of certain individuals has a catalytic effect on whether or not hunts occur. So once, you know, if, if this a particular gung-ho individual isn't there, then um, for a given group size, then hunts are less likely to occur. And it's, I've argued that it's because these impact males sort of, they, they hunt first, they cause chaos, um, and then make, change the equation for everybody else, essentially. Um, another submitted question from one of our asynchronous students is, um, what, are there any kind of reputational consequences or uh, social friction that are experienced when individuals that have meat do not share it? Um, or is it that, you know, kind of grudges might be held, but rank basically erases that behavioral um, record of it, I guess, for want of a better way to phrase it. But yeah. what, what kind of reputational things might be coming out of whether or not people are, people, chimpanzees are generous or stingy? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, my... In, my non-scientific impression is yes. Um, I think there are definitely, and that you can, and this is actually something that I've been meaning to do for a long, well, it's hard to do, unfortunately, is sometimes individuals, var they vary in who they beg from. And I, there are certainly, there were certainly some males from my field, my field times when 
I would just be, like they would refuse to beg. Like one 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 chimp had a carcass, and you know this male just was like, nope, I'm not, I, I I'm not going to do it. And you know whether whether that's because he knew he knew he wasn't going to get any, or he had some kind of a grudge. Who know who knows? But you know, from a scientist's perspective, I mean, I find that a very very difficult idea to test. So I'd be yeah. interested if people had ideas on that. I mean, because you know, how would you differentiate that? from you know bearing a grudge to how would you differentiate that from just simple reciprocal altruism right like if you didn't share with me last time then yeah it, it's hard yeah yeah excellent um okay rachel has a question um that is in the chat window uh rachel do you want to ask it or do you want me to read it sure i can ask it um Great. I know you are skeptical of the show off hypothesis, but I'm just curious if you've ever found data that supports that hypothesis in your research. Well, Kristen's gone now. No, so Kristen sent me a nice note saying, saying th thanks, but um, in short, no. Um, again, it's one of those things, one of those things that's really tricky to test. I mean, I guess ideally we'd want to look at whether males that hunted more had a faster or steeper rank trajectory or males that shared more had a steeper rank trajectory um something like that but the problem is one big confounding factor is that males some of the same traits that make a high ranking male make a good hunter right so it's really hard to differentiate the two. Um, and then also, unfortunately, we, you know, this is chimps again. We run into this problem of, of sample size, right? I mean, we've, here I'm you know, describing these two super long studies. Um, and yet, you know, the Gombe study has only been going on for, you know, essentially the, life, you know, the lifetime of a chimp, right? And so when you really want to look at these numbers, uh, they, get, they start getting small fast. which is why we need to continue long-term data collection. Absolutely. All right. Um, any other questions for Professor Gilby? I have a oh. question. Yes, please. Um, I might have just missed it. Um, but Probably not. <laughs> so when we're looking at sub-adult and adult, adults um and i know that there's strong evidence to show that with sub adults you're going to go for the brain immediately um did you do anything to check um just because when they're sub adults they're rather small and the brain is probably if i'm like understanding their anatomy just a very strong uh, concentrated area of protein um versus like their like arms will have very little meat on them and then once they get to adults, I would think that like their stomachs and their arms tend to have like a bit higher meat. Did you do anything um, research looking at the ratio um, of like increased like going to the stomach first because it's now um, more proportionate to the size of the brain or? Um, not, no, in short. I mean, one of the things that I did consider, I was actually ex this was a kind of a surprise result. I was kind of expecting one alternative hypothesis for them going for any um, internal organs is that they just tend to spill out <laughs> when a monkey dies, right? It's, so it's, it's gross, but uh, so it, it might, I thought it, you know, that, it, that might just be a, a, a side effect of just having a, a soft underbelly, right? Um, I mean, no matter what the brain, whether it's in a, whether it's in a sub adult or an adult is, is, is going to be valuable um, and arguably more valuable than anything else. So um, I think it was telling that in the sub adults, they never went for an arm or a leg first.
whereas they sometimes did in with the adult. So maybe that suggests that we need to we need to know more about what their what what nutrients are in these different organs. In, in short. Thank you. Sure. Um, Lauren Wilson was wondering how COVID-19 had impacted your research. <laughs> huh. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, in many ways. Um, it has, I mean, it, usually I go to the field every summer um, for at least a short amount of time um, to check in with the team and remind myself what a wild chimp looks like instead of sitting in front of a computer screen all day. And so I didn't get to do that. Um, we are very worried about the chimps. So we shut down uh, early on, we shut down all uh, data collection for a while. Um, chimpanzees do get COVID and Tanzania is uh, less stringent about um, the rules in terms of social distancing and so on. And so we did, we, do, we did have a team quarantine and the research has continued, but it's sort of a skeleton crew. Uh, so yeah, we hope that it ends soon. All right. Any uh, any final questions for Ian, um, who has generously shared so much of his expertise and time for us today? Um, oh, yeah. Luke has a question. Um, do you know if any of the chimps at Gombe or in any of the studied communities of chimpanzees have caught COVID? Not at Gombe and not to my knowledge anywhere else. We know that they can get it from captive work, um, but to my knowledge, no. And certainly, and certainly not. Well, we have we have a, we have a very good health team at Gombe um, that that monitors uh, you know all the chimps on a daily basis uh, whenever they can find them and are definitely paying attention to any sort of signs of respiratory illness um, and then would, would 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 test for it if if it if it shows up. I mean, they do they do um, often get respiratory illnesses, and this is a. a you know, an opportunity for me to say that, you know, that we all as chimp researchers are faced with a bit of a dilemma here in that um, they do catch our respiratory diseases and they're often more, much uh, higher consequences for the chimps. And so, you know, one could argue that we're endangering their lives by studying them. And so we definitely take, I mean, we were wearing masks with them in the field before this happened. Um, and keep our distance uh, as best we can and limit numbers of researchers and so on. Um, R Richard Rangham has shown that uh, have just having a research, having re a research presence in a national park um, actually increases the, the um, chimpanzee and primate populations. So while you know on an individual level we may risk you know, certain in, risk infecting certain individuals the fact that there's research presence cuts down on deforestation poaching and so on so it's, i would argue that that's our that's that's the, the 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 benefits outweigh the costs of doing research on wild primates excellent point um also one that was echoed by uh Zareen. Machanda in the in the uh, chat window. So, um, all right. If there are um, and no final questions, uh, everyone, please join me in enthusiastically thanking Professor Gilby for sharing his expertise and time with us, and um, hope to see you all next week at our next seminar. All right. Thank you so much, Ian. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you, guys.